Welcome back to the Flow Track Podcast. FlowTrackPodcast at gmail.com is our email address. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and on our website, flowtrack.org slash flowtrack podcast. Let a marathon now in the rear view, Gordon. We got a world record attempt again to talk about, which is uh, coming up tomorrow. Hopefully uh, you're recovered and ready to go. Yeah, two two world record attempts potentially. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and I think it's space. Is it officially the final track meet of 2020? Like, is this putting the lid on 2020 track and field? I think it is, unless some country somewhere is like, no, we moved our national championships to November 8th, and we are sticking to that date, which would not surprise me if someone popped up. But in terms of relevant track and field meets, Diamond League is done. Continental Tour is done. This has got to be it, right? You you are the master yeah. of the schedule. You know if something's out there. Well, we still do have World Half net, uh, in two weeks. So the World mm-hmm. Half Marathon Championships in Poland. And then we have nothing else because USATF officially canceled their Road 5K. They canceled Club Cross Country in December. Foot Locker was canceled. So now the only thing left are just high school – Cross country state championships and college conference cross country championships, and then there's nothing till 2021. So, are you saying that all eyes are going to turn to the ACC cross country championships? Is that what you're saying? No, they're all they're all going to turn to the Sun Belt conference championship. <laughs> Sun Belt is where it's at in Mobile, Alabama. That's where people want to know <laughs> who's going to win. Let's let's play a game. Can you name three Sun Belt schools? Oof. Is Troy in the Sun Belt? Troy is in the Sun Belt. Okay. Is Southern Alabama in the Sun Belt? Yes, but it's not called Southern Alabama. It's called South Alabama. I'm not sure if you thought those were the same. Okay. I did, but I can understand you. It's like Jeopardy. You got to really, you have to be specific. Otherwise, the judges are going to come back and take the point away. Yes. Uh, Last is, one. Uh, I'm not feeling confident about this, but is Florida Atlantic in the Sun Belt? Unfortunately, that is an incorrect. Uh, you get one more strike. If you don't get it, you uh, lose life savings. Okay. Well, my inclination is to think of another school that has Florida in it because there's like a million. Like there's Florida International, Florida Gulf Coast. Uh, but now I'm second guessing it. Sun Belt, Sun Belt. Come on, I know this. So the, Troy, South Alabama. Ah, okay, let's just go Florida International. No, no Florida teams. Uh, there are no Florida teams in Sun Belt. Yeah, you got teams like Arkansas State, Arkansas Little Rock, uh, Coastal Carolina, Georgia Southern, Georgia State. This is going to be a great Sun Belt Conference uh, podcast, which <laughs> this has diluted itself into. But what I'm, what the whole point was. Tomorrow's track meet is pretty much the end of 2020. That's what I'm trying to get to. You're right. You're right. And we have a special guest plan for it. You want to tell the people what we're going to be doing tomorrow alongside the Valencia World Record Day meet? Yes. Yeah, so the, uh, the event starts at 2.30 Central. That is 3.30 Eastern. I'm not sure what that is Hawaiian time, but 2.30 Central – uh, the women's race starts at 2.30. The men's race starts at 2.57 or something like that. Uh, and mm-hmm. we thought, hey, everyone's going to be watching this event. It's going to be live on Flow Track, so watch it on Flow. What better way to watch it than watch it with someone who probably is going to be one of the most uh, intrigued watchers of the in the entire world outside of uh, – outside, outside of – yeah, yeah, family, family members, right? Uh, Shadow Kip Churcher's training partner, Paul Chalimo, is going to be on Flow Track watching it with us. So if we see an American record go down, we're going to see his, his teammates' true live reaction to what could go down. Uh, so it's going to be fun. Get Paul. We haven't had Paul on the po- podcast yet, so it'll be like a little bit half podcast, half watching a world record attempt and an American record mm-hmm. attempt. It's going to be good times. And also, Chepta Guy is one of his rivals. They've battled many times before. Obviously, Chepta Guy 
took a step up this year. So I'm interested to know his thoughts as he's watching this sensational uh, season from a guy he's going to be racing against next year when he's trying to get a medal. So obviously he has a lot of stake in this race, not just with his teammate, but just in the event as a whole. And he's always fun to talk to just, just in general. He doesn't really hold back. He gives you his full unvarnished opinion. Yeah. Obviously, most intriguing for, like you said, for uh, Chili Moe's, the Chepta guy rivalry. But I really do think Kip Churcher, it's going to be interesting to see what he does. If you look at the fields on the women's and men's side, most of them are all just, everyone is focused on the top female and the top male, which is Chepta guy and Good Day. Uh, mm -hmm. But the introduction of Kip Churcher, Kip Churcher isn't there to just be a token extra athlete on the starting line he can run fast so what do you thought let's i i kind of want to start with kip churcher as the headline here over chip guy because chip guy we know is good we know he's a world record holder we know he's close to breaking a 10k world record but could we see kip churcher break galen rupp's american record i think it's very unlikely his pr is 27 07 he hasn't run a lot this year. He ran a, most recently a 5,000 at altitude in Boulder, and he ran 1339. I don't really know what that converts to or at what point in his training he was doing that, but 2644 is still a, a long way down. I obviously think he can run a personal best. He can get under 27 minutes, but I think that's a little too much to ask in, in a one-race jump uh, for for Kip Churcher when he really hasn't he hasn't shown anything this year that indicates he's you know in that type of shape. Okay, what did Chepta guy show going into the five k? He ran twelve fifty one on the roads. When in twenty twenty, I kind of paid. Yeah, in yeah, twenty twenty pandemic. Yeah, and before the pandemic. So yeah, it was then, it was a couple when, months. It was a couple months was before. In, was it? Was it in January or February? When did he do it? Uh, his twelve fifty one was in August. Sorry, I thought it was, it was last. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, February. It was February, last February. year. Oh, it was February. No, okay. February is this year. February. Look, I know everybody's oh, confused okay. on the timeline of twenty twenty. I don't blame <laughs> it, but no. I mean, Chepta guy went last year, and he won. You had me like second guessing what year we were in for a second there. Uh, <laughs> Look, Chepta guy, Chepta guy. I just is on think a roll. he he won. Yeah. Hold on, let me finish my point. Yeah, he wins okay. in Doha. He went. He has a good twenty nineteen. Wins in Doha, uh, and then goes and runs twelve fifty one. You're right. Hadn't run much before that. I didn't think before for Monaco he was going to drop that much time. You didn't either. Uh, but I think he's in a different situation than than Kip Scherzer is. I'm not saying he can't PR and run a great time. I'm just saying all the way down to 2644, that's a lot to ask. That's a lot to ask. Do you think he can do it or are you just being optimistic? Do you honestly well, think I just think it? the fact I just think the fact that you think he can PR, that means you think he's in shape. Because if he's PRing, he's running 27 flat, you know, and you don't just wake up and run 27 flat. You gotta be in great shape to be able to do that. And if you think he can PR, then I think he definitely can run 2644. And if you're in the, if another, your mind tells you, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> that's another twenty three seconds <laughs> over twenty five laps. Long. Yeah, that's a that's still a big jump, Gordon. I'm saying he could run. Is I'm saying it? I don't think he's gonna. I don't think he's flying all the way to Valencia because he's out of shape. That's what I'm saying. So I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt, the professional courtesy that he's he's gonna get in a good race here, and maybe he runs uh, something fast. But all the way down to twenty six forty four, that's another level of being in shape i'm willing to be surprised well, but i think that's a little bit of a stretch but i'm also willing to think that the 10k being a rarely run event is an event where you don't always most people's 10k pbs are not their true pbs because they never are running it often enough or in best situations enough for them to truly show their 10k peak and especially in a pandemic we don't even know anything about people's peaks because there's nothing going on. But the idea that, yes, 
23 seconds or what is it uh yeah what's his that yeah, yeah. 20 he had to run 23 second pr yeah that is a lot but it also isn't when you think about the race being not run often like that i mean check the guy right he was what 1250 Five twelve fifty PR mm-hmm. on on the outdoor yeah. track, and then he has a sixteen second PB or fourteen second PB, right? And the reason why is because he's not in enough fast five Ks. I just think the same thing applies to the ten K that people only strike lightning once every four years with the ten K, and therefore big PBs are possible, right? Are you, Hell, I, I, are, you, like, are you hearing something from, from the camp? Is that why you're so optimistic? What have you been hearing? No, what information I'm just, do you have that I don't have? I don't have any information. I just have, have the information. I just have the information <laughs> of like big PBs happen often in the 10K. How, how much did – all right. I know this is a bad example, but I'm going to use it anyway. How much did Edward Cesarek PB in the 10K this summer? Did he drop like a 90-second PB? Yeah, but I I mean Kip Chichar has been in some fast 10Ks. Yeah. Chez had never been in a professional 10K and he had mostly been in championship college 10Ks. Totally different. I would be uh, I would follow Kip you. Kip Chichar's PB is you. from a world final. It's not from a time trial. Yeah, but so is Chepty guys. That was a fat there's been fast world finals in the 10K. Listen, all these times at altitude are, are obscuring it. And Kip Chirchir ran 1308 indoors in February. So that's a good time. That's a good, that's a good mark. Right. Um, but then everything else has been in, in Colorado, Boulder, Fort Collins, Colorado Springs, all of them have been, you know, in the summer and in the fall. So he's raced a little bit. Nothing's blown us out of the water, but again, it's hard to read too much into those times, but I don't know. I'm looking at a guy who's had his, has had, Opportunities to run fast, been in fast races before, and he's 31 years old. I think if he does this, I would be shocked. I'll just say that. And it's good to be shocked still in 2020. I'm just not seeing I mean, I'm not seeing a lot of evidence that that he's gonna be at that same level that Rupp was when Rupp ran 2644. I'm willing to say though that at altitude, it's 20 seconds. So it's like him running a 1320. All right, thirteen teens. Is that you're you're better with conversions than I am? Is that accurate? Well, for the conversion for Flagstaff is thirty seconds. So, okay. okay, I'm not sure what Boulder would be. I'm saying maybe twenty to twenty five. Well, I think, and I think he's in. Be- I'll give him credit to say he's in better shape than that. I don't know the circumstances of the race, but I'm just assuming he he ran like a hard hard time trial type effort because. I mean, if he if he's in thirteen fifteen five k shape, he's not gonna be able to run twenty six forty four. Wouldn't you agree? Well, if he's in thirteen fifteen five k shape of an easy win, right? That's like he, you, I agree. You don't know if yeah. he went all out. I mean, maybe he went out there and it's like, all right, just go jog a thirteen fifteen, and we're ready to go. That's what I said. You know, yeah, that's what I said. I, I because he's gonna have to run back to back thirteen twenty twos, which is which is tough. So I do I do remember when I filmed the documentary on on Shadrach and Paul for the WCAP about their experience of joining the army and running for team US Army and, the, and all that good stuff. Shadrach did say his goal is to break the American record. I know that mm-hmm. I mean that's a lot of people's goals, but he's not like uh he wasn't like, oh I don't know. Galen Rupp was really fast. No, he was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. You know, I mean, Chalimo's the same way, right? Chalimo was like, I want to be the fastest person of all time, all the time. He's always saying that. He's like, I want to go undefeated. You know, he, he hasn't done some of this grand predictions, but I mean, he did get a medal. So that's good for Chalimo. But mm-hmm. Shadrach, I think you don't fly to Valencia in the middle of a pandemic unless you're in shape. And I think he might be. Why not? Maybe he's like, I think he's going to go for it. And I think he'll either just go for it and hit the wall and lap 20, or he'll go for it and he'll complete the task. 
I know you like comparing uh, uh, other seasons. So I pulled up Rupp's 2014 when he ran 26.44. Um, that year, indoors, he ran 13.01 at BU. And he ran, nine days later, he ran 8.07 at BU. Now, outdoor season, he ran 13.19 just 15 days before he ran 26.44. But I'm guessing he ran that as sort of like a <laughs> – a pace simulation event because uh, that would have been a miraculous turnaround for him. But as you know, I don't need to remind you, Rupp was fit in in 2014. Here we, here we go, though. We shouldn't look at 2014. We should look at 2011 because in 2011, Rupp ran 26.48, which was the American record at the time. And the previous year, he had run 27.10. So... 2710 so is similar we to compare, we should compare 2710 is similar to to uh Shadrach's PR right now, right? Shadrach okay. what? 2707? Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm so Shadrach's PR and Galen Rupp's old PR, Galen Rupp was 3 seconds slower, right? Then Galen Rupp goes on to run 2648. You make that 3 seconds faster. That's 2645, which is right near the 2644, <laughs> which is the American record. But let's look at the let's look at the 2011 season because that's the real season where he had his first like sub 27 performance because he PR'd mm -hmm. his 10K by four seconds, but whatever. So he ran sub eight three Ks. All right, it's uh he ran 1321, 1311, 1325, 1306. Mm-hmm. 1334. Yeah. 13, 1306 okay. was in Birmingham on July 10th. Yeah. He ran a 60 30 half marathon. I think, I mean, he he wasn't like going out there running on fire, right? 1320s, 1311s, 1325s, 1306. You could say that Shadrach is, can run 13 teens right now. I think the 10K is a different animal, and I think you don't need to show fast 5K uh, sh sharpness in order to to have a big 10K breakout race because it's a grind of a race. It's not just a speed type race. So mm -hmm. I think he's in a I think he's in a similar situation that Galen Rupp was in in 2011 when Rupp went on to break the American record and run 26:48. So just saying, it could happen. Okay. You should, too bad Lincoln's not on. You guys could put down another bet like you did for the men's uh, world record chances. Which are you well, are you feeling good about that bet now? One day out, what what you 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 suckered Lincoln into giving up seven seconds there, which is the all time just foolish gambler's move there by Lincoln because yeah. you used right against him. He's like, yeah, he's gonna run twenty six ten. Yeah, so I'm I'm, I'm confident with the bet. Because I can still witness a world record and win the bet, which is great. I get the <laughs> I best of both worlds. That's why it's that's why it was such a bad strategic play on his his part. It's like, no, he not only is he gonna run faster than a human being in history, he's gonna run seven seconds faster. But there should be something that makes you sweat, because we saw the pacing assignments, Gordon, and they are trying to go through the first five thousand in thirteen oh five, which is one of those marks that you see from a rabbit that just makes you go, whoa. That really makes you think about how fast this time is. And the person who's rabbiting him, Nicholas Camelli, was runner-up to him in Monaco. Ran 12.51 this year. I guess it's like if Shelby Houlihan decided to pace Safan Hassan in a 5,000 or Jakob Ingerbritsen was like, hey, Timothy Cherry, you need some help breaking the 1,500-meter world record? I'll take you along. Or a 1,200. Thir yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 13.05. Now, I'm assuming – He'll get what? Maybe he'll do one lap past that if he's feeling great because 1251 is his PR. He's going to be hurting pretty good at, at 1305, which means Chapter Guy is going to have to do 11 laps, 11 and a half laps by himself here after running 1305. What do you think of the pacing setup? Well, they're going to have wave like technology. Yeah. Okay. So he's not going to be by himself. He'll have this friendly little light bulb. <laughs> To run with to run with them, uh, thirteen oh five. It's it's just crazy when you think about pacing and you look at the time and they realize if someone ran thirteen oh five just as regularly, 
you'd be ranked very high up in the world, right? And this is the pacer. Uh, it it makes you realize how crazy. It makes you realize how crazy the 10K really is when you look at the 5K splits because most elite 10K runners, their 5K splits are the equivalent of great 5K individual performances. You know, mm-hmm. so you kind of forget that 27 minutes is 1330, right? Mm-hmm. And now if he's trying to run all the way up into sub 26 20s, that's. 1305. I guess that's what he has to do. I don't know, man. That's like, how much you got to pay someone <laughs> to do a 1305 effort and not even get the credit of it as a time in their history books? Like, they don't yeah. even get to say they ran 1305. Like, they just are, they get to say they have a DNF. You know? Yeah. Well, and if it was a regular year where there are other racing opportunities, you'd probably have to pay him a lot because he, his, perspective would be wait a minute i'm not gonna waste a 1305 on this i could win a race i could win money i could win a diamond league potentially running that yeah. fast especially if especially if chepta guy's not in the race for goodness sakes and now you're gonna have me do this pacing somebody better open the open the checkbook up it's bold i but when i look at it i'm like well if the record is 26 17 how much slower could he really go out i mean he could he could do uh they go out in 13 15 and then try to negative split but even that's only five seconds, uh, sorry, ten seconds slower. That'd be that'd be way far off. Sorry, they go thirteen ten, well, um, and then have a twenty six twenty. But they'd have to negative split. So I don't know. If the pacing is thirteen oh five, what will Shaddy do? Because Shaddy's not trying to run thirteen seven. I mean twenty six seventeen. So will he have well, his own pacer? If he's out there trying to run twenty six forty. Yeah, that's what makes me worried too about his his performance in this race is those secondary pace groups oftentimes don't really come together that well. Cause I think everybody puts the time and attention into the first pace group and making sure that works. And yeah. then there's less of an emphasis. You saw it even in the London marathon, right? Like Sarah Hall was kind of found herself in no, no, no man's land out there. And it was like, wait, no one's, there's no pace group here at all. Like it sort of just completely disintegrated and she was running pretty even split. So you'd think there would have been somebody out there. Yeah, that'd be a good question to ask Paul before the the race starts, like what he knows about the pace group, because this is not a big field listed. Um, but I would guess he'd need what? I mean, he'd want thirteen twenty if we're following the same yeah. formula. So you'd so you'd need a group that's fifteen seconds back uh, through five k, so about a second off that pace. I mean, everybody on this is everybody in this rabbiting group is is good. So they're going to have Dutch champion Roy Hornweg who's going to go through I think Great 1500 name. and yeah. And then Matt Ramsden of Australia, one of Australia's best runners is going to go through 3k and then All right name. So <laughs> So Camelli has two the rabbit has two rabbits here. So that will help him try to stay on track, but is Kip Chircher going to have three rabbits? I doubt it. I mean maybe there'll be one person out there running 13 uh 20 pace i wonder if is he gonna run with mcswain do you think because mcswain now mcswain's just trying to lower his aussie record it says in the release of 27 23 which is much slower but mcswain just ran 330 and 728 so i think he's in dang good shape so yeah maybe mix maybe mcswain and kip Cheercher go together but that would obviously would be a massive pr for for McSwain. There's gonna be a lot to watch. The cameraman better be on their toes in this race. Yeah, I'm hoping for some dual view action. The you know the Shadrach cam, the uh Chep the Guy cam. So if Shadrach it runs well if let's assume uh Shadrach let's assume uh Chep the Guy runs twenty six ten. I'll mm-hmm. give the Lincoln record the twenty six ten time. <laughs> I guess what will Shadrick have to run to not get lapped? You have to run twenty sub twenty seven fifteen. Basically, at the PR, yeah, to not get lapped. Yeah, 
Yeah, man, there's been a lot of fast people getting lapped these last few days. <laughs> it's been. I mean, McSween experience. definitely's got the PR to not get lapped, right? Yes. Yeah, and I think he will. I think he's he's better than twenty seven twenty five for sure, and he's obviously or twenty seven twenty three, and he's obviously in in great shape. I think. I think Chapter Guy's gonna do it. I don't think he's gonna go under the Lincoln mark, though. I think he's just gonna dip under because I think running that back half by himself is gonna be really, really hard. And if he goes out 1305, he gives himself a little bit of buffer, but he still has to run 1312 in the second half <laughs> to get the world record. Think about that. Think about that. That's a, that's a fast close. <laughs> yeah. 1312. I mean, and do I, you, I do what do you think he what do you think he runs his last lap in? I mean, I think he'll close. Assuming like he maintains the 26, he's in the 26 20s as the finish. What do you think his last lap will be? Let's let's set the over under of last lap of 62. I was going to say 62 and a half. Yeah, that's a good line. A good line. I'll, I'll go just, I'll go just over that. Um, Remember when he did the 5K, he was just like clicking them off, like boom, boom, boom. Like he was right yeah. at 60, 61 the entire time. He's going to find that same groove. I am interested to know how much the wave light will help him because he said before it didn't really because it's it's like underneath him. He's not really like looking at it. And also he was ahead of it. And if he runs 13.05 for the first 5K, he's going to be ahead of the light. Yeah. Isn't he? Or are they going to set the light for like what he wants his splits to be? So the light's going to be like <laughs> speeding up and slowing down. I, I don't think that's just the be case. A coach just set it. controlling it. Be like, all right, faster, 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 slower, 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 faster, faster, faster. That would be fun. That would be great coaching. That'd be fun. Yeah. Dude, when we get back out there, I want to go to a meet with the wave light and I want to see like how it works and like what the computer looks like to to get it to go. That'd be fun. I want to do a feature or on imagine, the wave light. Imagine you're some just like tech whiz who's like in high school or college mm. and then you go to a track meet and you hack the system and you're like yo watch this i'm gonna make him go way too fast and then you make it go really fast or like you make him go really slow you're like why are they jogging it's like you know you're like there was I one like time it. there was one time uh i was in choir in church and okay all the people like in the choir sit in the front of like like on stage right and we're like in pews and we're like hiding and there's because we're behind the speaker, like the where the priest talks or whatever, he has a speaker, so we won't be able to hear because the speakers are going outward and we're behind him. So they give us these mini speakers in our pews so we can hear what he's saying. But there's mm -hmm. like a wire attached to it. And me being like a teenager, I'm like bored. I started fiddling with the wire. And then I pulled out the wires, right? Nothing happened. But then I take the two wires oh, and no. I connected them. Oh, and then no. it turns off. It turned off the audio for the entire speaker, people, everyone. So I was able to turn off his mic whenever I wanted to. And so throughout, I only did it one Sunday. Throughout the entire Sunday, I was like, I turned him off every like five seconds or every like minute or so. <laughs> and they were like, what is going on? And I was like, yo, watch this. And it just goes, because it goes from like speaker volume to then echo, right? Because you can't, it's, yeah, it was yeah. a good time. So I can imagine some kid going to like, Eugene's debut opening of Hayward Field with yeah, the yeah. wave like technology, and it's just like some whiz kid in sophomore year at Oregon. So you watch this and make him go fast or slow. I thought you were gonna say. I thought where that story was gonna go is a good story. By the way, is you pulled out the wires, you stuck them together, and then you felt a jolt throughout your body, and then the next thing <laughs> you know, you had just memorized all of Tifers, and then you never went back. Well, I thought you were going to say I got the Holy Spirit from the jolt. Whoa, yeah, okay. there well, yeah, maybe. No, yeah, but uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but I think wave like technology needs to make sure it has some good security. That's all I'm saying because these <laughs> athletes' physical lives are depend on it. You know? On the women's women's race, uh, Latensa Bet Gade is talking big, Gordon. She's saying she wants to go out for this 14:11 world record from Tiernish to Baba. Her PR is 14.23. She's run 14.26 this year in Monaco. So a a tall order for her. Where would you put her chances? Uh, I don't think her chances are as good as Chepta guys, but looking when you look deeper into it, 
you can paint a picture in your head of it happening. Like you can, you can foresee something crazy happening. I think it's probably more of a five to ten percent likelihood, but you don't get where you are in life with a five to ten percent chance of breaking a world record unless you're an elite talent, right? I don't have a five to ten percent mm-hmm. chance of breaking a five k world record. So, anytime someone gives you five to ten percent chance of something, that means you're pretty good at it. Uh, with that said, I think she's probably this can. I mean, she'll have the Pacers, but I think. It's it just seems like kind of like a last minute like oh yeah I'm gonna go for this world record whereas Chepta guy has had this like build up you know he has his team surrounding him he has his teammates go out there running a London marathon and then he has this 5k attempt and now he goes to the 10k it seems more like the 2020 was all about Chepta guy where this seems kind of like oh yeah I'll go for it and it the I it's not like. I think her season isn't centered around this race. Maybe it mm-hmm. was for the past two to three months, but overall the mentality wasn't there. And therefore I think she runs, you know, maybe she PRs. I think she just runs sub 1430 and that's what we get. The best thing she has going for her is this is a complete no lose situation. So many times when people say they're going for a world record, it might be in the midst of another, um, an, uh, like somewhat of a deeper context. So like she, she really has nothing to lose here, right? The, the entire race is set up for her to get the world record. Losing doesn't really matter. There's no other races on the calendar. So she can go out at world record pace. And if it doesn't happen, there's no big deal. It's not like she's losing status um, towards the diamond league. It's not like she's risking a DNF heading into a major championship. This is it. There's no medal on the line here. So she could actually really, really go for it. That's the strongest argument for why she could do it. You know, being 12 seconds off, that's a stretch. That's going to take a big PR. We saw Chapter Guy do something similar earlier in the year. But yeah, I'm interested to see what she can what she can do when there's really no inhibitions. I started thinking though, Gordon, we could have had a really, really good Valencia women's 5K attempt with just just the women who have been competing this year. So you don't even need to talk about Almez Ayana. You don't need to talk about Genze Abedibaba. But imagine if also in this race was Shelby Houlihan, who ran what she did this year, Krisha Schweizer, who was just behind her in that same fast race in Oregon, Obiri and Tirop, who just went 1-2 in Nairobi, and Safan Hassan, who ran that one-hour world record. You could have had a bunch of women in there who could be breaking 1420 in a race, and then you have the hope of one of them breaks through. Now, that probably would have turned into something that I said dis, uh, discourages world records because people would have tried to win and maybe they would have slowed it down a little bit so it wouldn't have been the complete no inhibitions race, but that would have been fun to end the season, right? With, that, with, with like an all-star women's 5,000? Yeah. If only we had a system for that. Like, uh, what? What do we do every four years? It's something that happens like internationally. With, like with the I just wanted someone to get a gajillion dollars. I wanted Nike to be like, for some reason, we're going to throw twenty million dollars at this, and we're going to, and then we're going to spend uh, whatever it takes. Basically, this is going to be the Prefontaine Classic. If you're a Nike athlete, you're coming, um, but we're limiting the field size to like these top six women, and just go for it. Would be cool. You did would be cool. Speaking of, uh, you did mention what Krisha Schweizer in that field, right? Yeah, she would earn her way her- in. She earned her way in. You run fourteen twenties, yeah. you you're in. Her sister, Kelsey Schweizer, made her NCA collegiate cross country debut. Uh, this past oh, weekend. that's called a yeah. uh, that's called a segue, folks. Because Gordon wants to talk about NCAA cross country. I'm not going to hold you back anymore, Gordon. You've been so patient. Think, Give us a rundown. I'm just Let's assuming. Go. I'm just assuming it's her sister because her name is her name is Kelsey Schweizer, and she runs for Missouri. So the odds of another female going to Missouri with the first name with the same letter. And the last name with the same name. The odds are she's her younger sister. She's more of a mid distance runner looking at it. She did finish 34th at the Gans Creek Classic, running a 22 22 6K. So she has some work to do. She's not at the her sister's level yet, which makes you think about that. Like, it must be weird to like go to college 
being the younger sibling of a superstar like NCAA athlete. I mean, like there's another guy, Jack Tyrion, who runs for Wake Forest. He won his race recently. He's Pat Tyrion's little brother. It must be crazy. It's just like, yeah, well, my older brother won NCAAs, you know, goes to the Olympics, stuff like that. Well, my older sister, you know, is like one of the best runners in America right now. It's got to be weird. Mm -hmm. Like, no, what do you talk about? Like, what do you it, like? Ah. I'm so happy probably, my older brother wasn't good at running because that would have been like a mind bent. I was gonna say a bad word there, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. On my on my mentality going into sports. So anyway, but unfortunately for you, he's one of the greatest content creators and podcasters of all time. So you're still in his shadow. Yeah. No, my brother doesn't even know. My my brother still uses RSS feeds. Do you know what an RSS is feed Link is? Yeah, is your brother Lincoln? No, my brother's on Lincoln. Okay. Uh, he's he does, he's like, why do I need Twitter when I have an RSS feed? I'm like, Adam, come on. And it's crazy because he lives in he lives in the Bay Area. He's he works for a tech company. He's surrounded by all these you know tech, Facebook, Google types. Yeah, does he have he's Google like, Buzz? Twitter. Still? I don't know. Google Buzz. What's, What's Google that? Buzz? Well, wasn't that it looks like an RSS feed? What's the Google thing that just uh, that they finally was it Google Plus? Google had something that they rolled out like a long time ago. Well, they had a go thing. oh, it was they, they had a social media or something. I feel like Google Buzz was a thing. Google Buzz. What a Google Google know. Buzz and just see see what comes. Google out. Google Buzz. That's going to be propaganda oh, yeah. back. You can't. Then, no, here it is. Google Buzz is a social networking, microblogging, and messaging tool that was developed by Google, which replaced Google Wave. Google. <laughs> Who Wave. can forget <laughs> Google Wave? The great Google no. Wave. Google Plus was also a social network. That was launched on June twenty eighth, twenty eleven. Tell me about cross country, though, Gordon. This is going to be our only chance because tomorrow we're not recording a pod. Well, we're just going to record the the watch party. We'll post that out later on the day, on Wednesday. So if you wait for a midday pod, you're going to have to wait. Tomorrow's going to be an evening pod, and then Thursday we'll recap it, and then by Friday we'll be so far onto the next thing that we will not be talking about what happened last week in NCAA cross country. So you have like ten minutes now. I'm going to, Alon's going to mute my mic and turn my camera off. I'm going to take a small, <laughs> small nap. <laughs> well, Just kidding, uh, we, we had a couple of races that went down. Uh, Cowboy Jamboree, Wesley Kiptu, formerly known as Wesley Bengura, won again, which uh, some people are like, who is this guy? It's like, well, we knew who he was. We preseason ranked him to be finished sixth nationally. So it makes sense that he's winning all these races because he has yet to lose to someone. I guess. We thought that uh, Isaiah Rodriguez was going to be up there, but Wesley Kiptu beat him at Cowboy Jamboree on Oklahoma State's home course. So that was an impressive win for Wesley Kiptu. I think Kiptu is going to be, he's like, he's going to be like a Vincent Kiprop. He's going to be like a Edwin Kurga. He's going to be that transfer guy, comes in the NCAA and competes for top three spots individually in the rest of his career. Uh, so Wesley Kiptu is now your new. Number one ranked athlete, mm. Mario Garcia Romo. He's still ranked two because of his SEC preview result, but he did get shellacked by uh, this kid from what from Charlotte, Paul. Yeah, Arredondo. Arredondo. Arredondo which yeah. you were like, who is this guy? He's not that bad. I mean, he's run a fourteen oh nine five k. So, I didn't say who is this guy. I just said this was a monumental upset. Now, this was before Kipchoge lost, so it ended up being the second biggest upset of the weekend, <laughs> but it's big. But it's really not that big of an upset because he's won his first two races, so he's undefeated, right? So look out for Paul Ardenando of Charlotte. Ardenando. Um, on the women's Ardenando. On the women's side, uh, Sarah Chapman of Missouri beat all the Arkansas athletes, which was pretty impressive. Um so hmm. impressive. We now ranked her number one overall after that performance. Uh, Mercy Chilenga finally got her shit together and won a race for us. She won the Florida State Invitational. She made me look bad with a third place finish in the Commodore Classic. Most people who are listening to this podcast right now have no idea who these people are, have no idea what these names of these meets are, like Commodore Classic. What is that? They don't know. Uh, basically, it's a long-winded story. Of just hey, go to the site. We have our updated COVID era cross country rankings where you can see where everyone ranks mm -hmm. based on 2020 cross country performances only. No resume boosting, 
movement. It's only what you've run so far in 2020. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to quiz you on your rankings. Are you ready? Just to see how well you know your rankings. Because what you did is you ranked virtually everybody who's competing right now. You went the deeper virtually, than you do. You, the, word, the word virtually is not fair. I literally ranked everyone. Sorry. Sorry. I didn't know if there were more than 595 men competing. You're saying there's only 595 men competing in Division One right now? There's only been 595 right? men who have raced who have run so right. far. Okay. And usually on a normal season, the deepest you go is 255. So with fewer teams competing and less at stake, you extended the rankings by over – like by 340 people. So I'm going to ask you, Gordon, just do, without looking at your rankings right now, I want you to tell me who is number 200. Do you have any clue? Do you have any idea who number 200 is? Thomas Ratcliffe? No, Chase Dornbush. I'm going to see if you can get one of these right. I thought uh, you were. I thought you were finding because he's ranked really low. That's why I said his name. Oh, you you think? No, I, I want to see if you know people who are just ran. How about one hundred? Do you know one hundred? No, I don't even know who five is. Like, come on, dude. Like, okay. I don't know anything. It's a computer a algorithm I created. Do you really think I'm five. manually looking at every single athlete and put them on a big board and be like, all right, yes. where are you? Yes, yes that's what no. I expect. Yes, that's I'm not what doing you that. I'm not doing some college football playoff committee. They only have to rank four people. I'm not going to rank 500 people that way. Uh, five on. is Jacob McLeod, to answer your question. Nagus is in their third, but Notre Dame didn't run. The men did not end up uh, traveling because of uh, COVID. So. Did they get COVID? I know is we, that official? I heard rumors that they no, got COVID. So they released a statement. They said they didn't have any uh, – Let me. I want, I'll, I'll read the exact thing here. While I talk about this, pull, talk about something else. While I pull this up. Well, the women ran, so the women were there, and the, the men didn't run. We heard rumors that they got COVID, but no, maybe it's not. I, I just said that. <laughs> well, you got no. you got to spread the rumor. No, no, I'm going to correct the rumor. I'm reading from their site right now. Hold on, it's okay. Uh... Well, I'm waiting for you to look it up. Until then, here, here, here. I'm, I'm going full on on the rumor. Out of abundance, out of an abundance of caution, the men's team will not be traveling to Louisville this weekend for the Louisville Classic. We currently do not have any active COVID nineteen cases, but this week we had several members of our men's team placed in quarantine after they were deemed close contacts of individuals who tested positive. In order to ensure the safety of everyone this weekend's meet, we feel it's in everyone's best interest to not travel and compete this weekend. So, Ooh, I just how wanted to say that crazy, because, how right. crazy it would be if Notre Dame just took out the entire live in Lou live in Lou XC Classic field, just be like, boom, you all get COVID. Well, they didn't because they didn't go. But I just wanted to clarify because we had Garrett on last week and we were talking about Louisville. So people might have been like, hey, whatever happened at, uh, to them at that meet? He didn't run. But he's still number three. He's still, still number, number three. three. Where do you, the, have team yeah, you, you have team rankings Listen. on here too. Yeah, I do. Of course. Yeah. Team rankings, Notre Dame number one. Team rankings? Uh, yeah, Notre Dame stays number one. Uh Arkansas, number two. Oklahoma State, now number three. Iowa State, four. Syracuse, five. NC State, six. And so on. Uh, makes sense, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we all Notre Dame, Arkansas, and Iowa State were all top ten uh, nationally, even in a regular season. So it makes sense that they're all here in the top four. Oklahoma State had a good run, uh, so that's why they're, they're now up in the mix. And then on the women's side... Um, Arkansas now is number one over NC State. Arkansas has been very impressive with their pack running and uh, especially doing it in a year where they lose four of their top five. It's just like very impressive for Arkansas to go what we thought would be a down year to now becoming like, hey, no, it's just, just like a, we, we, we reloaded. You know, they got those transfers – and they have a transfer from Clemson, one from Furman, one from Penn State, and they're putting together some good runs. So it's pretty cool for Arkansas. The Arkansas head coach Lance Harder was on the second podcast on Flow Track, which we say is the the lesser baby. of the two, the baby podcast. We call it the baby pod, the baby pod, the B race, just yeah. the B the B race. Yeah, the uh, the open invite, uh, Alex and. <laughs> <laughs> Alex and Ryan's podcast. They don't even listen to our podcast or whatever. Did you listen to Harder on their podcast? Not yet. Did you? No. 
But the headline looked good because they're talking about <laughs> what the Arkansas head coach thoughts are on having two cross country seasons because that's literally what's happening we're having our cross country yeah. season right now and there are when all is said and done there's going to be 600 700 plus athletes on the men's and women's side who will have done a cross country season and then they're going to do it again mm-hmm. in in the winter which is gonna be weird right like i think about yeah. this like if we actually do end up having ncaa championships if you're an SEC athlete or ACC, like if you're Arkansas, is it going to be a competitive advantage that you don't have to run an SEC cross country championship right before your NCAA championship? Like you'll be well rested, right? You don't have to go to the well, right? Like, will Big Twelve SEC now? schools and ACC schools have a better? I just think have the, a better yeah advantage. May maybe, but. I just I think a lot of those schools that don't emphasize cross country are gonna put their best people into indoor if if it's happening. I should listen. And to then the if that happens, NCAs will get canceled. No, I'm just saying like I don't know, just say for example like Taylor Werner was running this year and she had cross country eligibility. She doesn't, but let's just say like I think their focus would be to put her towards indoors, and they would just not have her run. Like they would keep her out of cross country because they would want her to score points indoors. That's what I think. But that's all for SEC purposes. Both for nationals but, too. I don't. I don't think she'd run nationals. I think mean, she'd run indoor nationals. Don't wouldn't wouldn't Lance Harder care more about putting together a good cross country team? Over I mean, it depends if the team ha- for a national team. Uh, I mean, it dep- depends on the team and the program. Like, if it was just. If it like there was no chance that your team was going to win, but you you could win indoor with her winning a double in a five k or a three k or a DMR, I think then you'd put her on there. And a lot of these teams they they're just emphasizing indoor track. I just I don't think they're going to want to go backwards to to cross country. I'm just think I'm speculating. I do not have any information. Not reporting this at all. I haven't listened to the podcast. I well, I, do that I just think, that. but like Yard Nagus just said that they're going to do cross country over DMR. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Well, what I was thinking, track, like indoor-focused schools, I was thinking more SEC-type schools. Yeah, That's but I thinking. just think that there's really only two indoor contending title teams that have good cross-country, and that's Oregon and Arkansas, right? Like, no one is worried about Texas A&M or Florida or Houston's or LSU's cross-country programs. And you no, power. they'll do. But right, like, if we're being real, like the only it's really Arkansas and Oregon are the only really cross at the national level of like, hey, we could be good at both. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think the LSU coaches go to sleep at night being like, oh, how am I gonna win at NCA cross country and NCA mm-hmm. indoors? They're like. I'm going to win NCAA indoors. That's all I care about, right? So right. So so don't don't you see them then putting out a cross country team in, in with the B team basically, and then just put, focusing all their time and energy on indoor, even though they don't really have. It's not like it's not like a lot of teams don't have any relevant people anyway, so it doesn't actually matter. I yeah. saw that the I saw that the Southern Conference is back on for their conference championships this fall. Oh, for so there's another this fall. So we can get Furman action. So Furman's on the track now. So, so now, well, no, they're on the cross country course, I think. Uh, on, the, on the course. So there's another team for you. How many times, if you had to estimate in your head since March, how many times have things changed with respect to how <laughs> the season would be? The, would you say like 15 would be the number? 30? It's got to be yes. somewhere in between that two. So how many I more? I just times like how we thought there was going to be no football. And now, literally, almost every FBS school is playing football. Yeah, well, there wasn't football. It, there wasn't like the, the, the literally. It would have been it have been like if the Boston Marathon was like, guys, the Boston Marathon's canceled. It's virtual only. And then two months later, everyone's like, it's back on. We are doing the Boston Marathon. But I'm saying, how many? It's changed that much since last March. How many more times do you think it's going to change between now and this coming March? I think it's fair to say it's going to go back and forth a few more times. 
I think it's going to happen. I think that the coaches in, uh, who are Cross upset. Happen? Yeah, I think the coaches who are upset okay. are just going to be drowned out. I'll be like, all right, cool. You're one coach of 300. Thanks for your opinion, but we're going to just mm-hmm. keep going. I don't think that the coaches are going to be able to stop the train from moving. And I think that basically – it's going to be Oregon and Arkansas who are going to have the hardest decisions because they're the ones who have to worry about team on both in both sports. Everyone else will have individual decisions, right? Like Yer Nagus, will they care about winning a DMR or putting together a cross country team? But that's just an event, right? As opposed to like mm-hmm. a team thing. Like I don't think the Notre Dame weight thrower is going to be upset if the DMR comes or it doesn't come, right? Because they're not trying to win a team title, right? So I think uh, I think though this is isn't this about though like conference championships? Because you're di- even if you're not at a relevant distance school at the national level, you need to put some people in these conference distance races so that way you can score points and and help your team place well in conference. Sure, for but SEC doesn't have to and, worry about that. Right. SEC doesn't have to worry I'm about saying, that, right? Well, but I'm but, but when there'll be a conference indoor championship. That's what I'm saying. So, oh, am I prepping them from for cross country, or am I prepping them for a conference indoor? You, you are you saying they're just gonna they're gonna skip the season altogether with when it comes to cross country, you just do indoor because they don't have a cross they don't have a, they've already done their conference championship. Is that what you're thinking? Well, I'm just thinking they'll they'll do their conference indoor championship. And then if they're not fast enough yeah. for NCAA indoors, they'll just go over on the NCAA cross country championship. Cause they already have the SEC. They'll use their SEC yeah. win at, in, in the fall to count towards points to qualifying in the winter. I don't know. It's all going to be I'm crazy. Just, yeah. I'm just trying to put myself in the mental space of like a power five coach whose program is in the middle and they have an 800 meter runner who can score six points at the indoor meet and then, but then they're out, but are you going to have them? But they're also the team's like fifth runner in cross country. Well, I don't want them focused on cross country when they can score me six points at the indoor meet in the 800 and they're not next. Yeah, so Let's just can... say, they're, well, they're not in, in, in this example. It's not like they're running for a national championship either way. Cause there's a lot of athletes like that. There's more athletes like that than there are like Nagus or other people out yeah. there who are like, Oh man, well, what's, what's, uh, what are these Arkansas guys going to do? What are these What are these Oregon women going to do? It, it, it's it's more often than not just like this person who's relevant in both teams but not going to be a national factor that the coach is going to have to figure out what to do. I think that's what they're pushing back against. Do you know what it's going to be like? What's it going to be I like? I just realized. The Sixers. No, it's going to be like any other world championship, Olympic championship. We rarely – get the eight best athletes in an event to compete in the final. You know why? Because we're not going to get to see Michael Norman in the 200. We're not going to get to see the little Muhammad and Cindy McLaughlin in the open four because they're choosing a different event. No one says the 200 doesn't count when, I mean, I say it, but when the (laughs) Guliav wins it for Turkey, when it just happened to be the year when Bolt was done, uh, Gatlin was done, uh, all the guys didn't care about the 200 at that moment, right? Yeah. Wade Van Niekirk was out, right? We mm-hmm. have watered mm-hmm. down events all the time at the world level. Well, That's got, what we're going have at the college beat, level. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, we always have watered well, down we, events. Like, no one, yeah. or like Safan Hassan, right? She didn't run the 5K, right? Mm-hmm. Are we saying that the 5K winner last year doesn't count? No, I think that's what's going to be here. I did. We're going to have a watered down cross country and we're going to have a watered down indoor. And it's just going to be the year when things got a little bit easier for certain athletes. They got lucky. Yeah. I think it's too soon soon to tell because we don't know how different teams are going to play it. That's one thing we're going to have to like, like in retrospect, we'll look back and say, oh yeah, that race ended up being not as deep as we thought it was because I still think there's going to, it's going to change a bunch, but that, that is a, I think that's an app comparison. I think I definitely could, yeah. could see that. But I, I mean, yes, I wonder. Water I down wonder about the. But I the thing is, the, the scenario I'm proposing, though, the, the, <laughs> sorry, leave him alone. 
Leave him alone, man. It's ridiculous. I want to dunk one more the time. Thing, the, the thing I'm – but what I'm saying is like you're not going to notice if the person who got six at their conference meet in this scenario, like this woman, this hypothetical woman who gets six in her conference meet who runs 207 in the 800, like you're not going to notice if they're not at the national meet. That's not going to impact the legacy of that championship. But what that does do is that impacts – coaches deciding to either support this or kick and scream about it. And that that's why I think it's notable. But I think at the top, the big names are going to find their way there. They're going to have less – there's, there's going to be fewer issues with, like, big names. Like, what's – well, like, Wayne Kalati in this scenario. What's Wayne Kalati's season going to look like? You're, you're, you're close with New Mexico. Well, New what's Mexico – yeah, that's a good point. I think Where's Joe Franklin. Joe, I don't know what Joe would do. I know he Joe doesn't care about conference championships. I know about, I, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but you know he he his his administration he says yeah you you can prioritize scoring indoors than scoring across conferences, which makes sense, right? Because mm-hmm. they don't have when you have a good distance class, you should prep them for winning yeah. national titles, not conference titles. Uh, uh, yeah, Kaladi, I think she would – I honestly think she would double. I think she would run one indoor race and then try to win cross-country on a Monday. I think she would okay. run the 5K on Friday and then the 6K on a Monday. Okay. And if she did that and just say everybody followed her lead because they're like, whoa, Lane Kaladi, she's the best sister in the nation. If she's doing it, I'm going to do it. Would you say either one of those are watered down, the eventual result? You'd obviously say it's a unique situation. But the rules would be clear to everybody and it'd be fair, right? Well, what's watered down is going to be the ability for athletes who normally – I mean, the 3K would be watered down, right? Because you'd be like, all right, well, okay, you, you don't know. The, the main thing is it's going to help. It, it's basically going to hurt – teams that score points in distance events at the national level with, with the team on the line, which normally is Arkansas, right? And, it'll, and mm-hmm. it's going to help Florida, like Florida, or like Texas A&M, right? Maybe Texas A&M has the fifth, they have a, they have a guy who can, who runs like 358 in the mile, right? Or 359 mm-hmm. in the mile. And he makes it to NCAAs. He's not going to score. Right, but if all of a sudden the top eight milers in a nation are like pulling out, all of a sudden, hey, maybe I can score and get a point, and that helps Texas A and M, but that hurts Florida because Florida be like, hey, where's my Wisconsin and Stanford and NAU making sure Texas A and M doesn't get that extra point, right? Yeah. So that's where it becomes, you know, weird. Yeah. It's basically it hurt. It's gonna make it weird for these power track programs who have that one or two points in the 800 and up. So, you know, who's, you know, who's going to be busy during this time and you know, who's going to be taking some enjoyment in all this is you. Cause you're going to look at all the different scenarios and all these coaches yep. are going to be texting you. Hey, do you know if such and such is running this race? Oh no, you're going to have, you're going to create the craziest flow chart ever created. I think. <laughs> With like, it's like a Venn diagram inside of a flow chart. It's like shoots and ladders. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be, it's gonna be it's a gonna good, be good rest up. Be be ready, man. For I'm saying, you know, lay low. There's nothing to cover anyway. Lay low November December, and then just be ready because this could be the moment you've all been waiting for, and you've been training for specifically. All right, let's let's wrap up this pod with final predictions. What will uh, the women's time be? What will Chapter Guy run and what will Shadrach run? I think Joshua Chapter Guy will break the world record. He's going to sneak just under it with a 26 15. I think on the men's side of things, I think Shadrach Kip Chircher is going to go under 27. I'll give him a 26 59. And on the women's side of things, no world record there. I think she'll start out on pace, but falter towards the end and she'll run 14 24. I'm going with the 1429. I'm going with a 2646. 
So he misses Oof. it by two seconds, Shadrach. And then I'm That's going with a, I know, I'm going with a 26, 17. Wait, so does he get it or not? That's the exact time he's he run, needs. He's going to run 26, 17. Point what? Point five three? We're, we're not, we, we don't need to run. We don't need to know the points. <laughs> I'm just saying it's gonna be 26-17. I won't know. I I can't tell you if it's a world record or not world record, but it's gonna be 26-17. Wow, what a hedge! What a hedge! Yeah. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you to Alon for producing again tomorrow, 2 p.m. Central Time, or just after 2 p.m. Central Time. Let's start. You know, get to your computer by 2 p.m. and get ready for that watch party. We go live at 2:15. 2:15. We'll get ready for the watch party with Paul Chalimo, Gordon Mack, Lincoln Shrike, and myself, Kevin Selly, and we'll watch some fast races, the last races on the track in 2020. We'll see you guys then.